It's a blessing to be able to welcome you this morning to Grace Bible Church. If you're visiting, uh, my name is Craig. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, we're glad that you're here. And um, hopefully you had a chance to pick up an order of service on the way in. There are also Lord's Supper elements that you may have noticed on the way in as we have the Lord's Supper each Sunday. And so if you're a baptized believer and will be partaking with us, we'll be talking about that later in the service, but just good to know uh, as you're getting things together to begin this morning. Before we begin our worship service time, I'd want to point out several things just announcement-wise, and you can find those on pages 14 and 15 in your bulletin. Um, mainly what I want to highlight is just what's coming up this week as we move toward Christmas Day. Um, on Friday, we'll be having a Christmas carol sing-along right here in the chapel from 6.30 to 7.30. So it'll be an hour of singing many of our favorite Christmas hymns together. And we're really looking forward to that. And then we'll have a time of um, fellowship and yummy snacks like hot cocoa and things of that sort afterwards uh, under the lights there in the side yard. So it'll just be a great time of um, gearing up towards celebration of Christmas Day. And then you'll notice for the next two Sundays, so December 24th uh, and December 31st, we won't be having discipleship hour. We'll gather together at 10 a.m. for fellowship and refreshments like we usually do, and then we'll have our worship service um, together. And so those are important things to note about the next two Sundays, and then we'll resume um, regular hours um, with Discipleship Hour and Grace Kids starting on January 7th. And so just a few things to take note of there. I encourage you to look at the other items as you look ahead toward January. Uh, you can find that on page 15. One thing to notice is we'll be collecting baby items for Alternatives Resource Center um, from Alternatives Medical Clinic. We'll be talking about that more in January, but um, as you're finding things on sale or thinking about how you could bless others during this time, you could um, keep your mind on January when we have an opportunity to bless many um, expecting families who are making a choice to keep their baby and may find themselves in really difficult situations. And so we're able to bless them with all kinds of material goods through alternatives. And so that's coming up in January and something you can just keep in mind. There will be more information about that as we get closer. Well, this morning we're continuing our series in Advent. And it is uh, the four Sundays leading up to Christmas when we really focus on our, our waiting, our longing for Christ to come again, and especially in light of his first coming and all that's secured for us. Um, but the, the looking forward and the, the present groaning that we experience waiting for all things to make right, uh, be made right. And it, it's just a meaningful time together. And so we'll be continuing thinking about what it means to be waiting for our God this morning. But our call to worship reminds us of that as well. And we're going to read in just a few moments Isaiah 12. But one of the things that it reminds us of uh, as we read it is you'll hear these words, your anger, um, you were angry with me when speaking of the Lord. And one of the things that we're reminded, especially in this context to the people in Isaiah's day, is we all come before the Lord as those who have sinned against him. Uh, this morning, no matter how great your week has been, no matter how good your morning has gone or whatever it might be, we have all sinned against the Lord in many ways. But part of the wonder of what we celebrate during this time of year is that the Lord Jesus came so that God's anger could be turned away from us. And so that as we gather together this morning, we can do so knowing that the wrath that we deserved for our sins, if we are trusting in Christ, it has been fully paid for. And that now we gather as God's people, sons and daughters of the God of the universe, brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can sing and declare with joyful hearts the salvation that is ours. And even as we look forward to the fullness of that salvation one day, God has turned away his anger toward us through Jesus so that he can comfort us today and encourage our hearts while we wait for the Lord Jesus to come again. And so our call to worship will remind us of those things and call us to sing those things. So I invite you, if you're able, please stand and I will read the regular print and then you can join with me on the bolded print there in verse two uh, and just as we say these things together. Hear God's word. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. 
I will trust and will not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Let me pray for us as we begin. Our Father in heaven, we gather in all different states of strength. Uh, many of us feel very weak and broken. We are groaning as we go through this life that's filled with sorrows and trials and afflictions. And we pray that you would renew our strength today as we worship you, that we would come and bring our weakness, our brokenness, and you would give us yourself and that you would in that strengthen our faith, that you would encourage our hearts with the joy of our salvation that is ours through Christ, and that you would renew our hope in what awaits us as your people and fill us with a peace that passes understanding of the presence of, of your presence even now by your spirit. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, as we begin to sing, we'll sing, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, which looks forward to uh, what will happen when Christ returns and all the fullness of that. And then we will sing, I will glory in my Redeemer, as we do get to praise the Lord Jesus even now for what he is doing for us and has done for us on the cross. So let's sing these two songs together this morning.
Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning is from Psalms, Psalm 126. In your pre-Bibles, that will be on pages 517 through 518. Psalm 126, hear the word of the Lord. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Please join me as we pray. Our dear great God and Father, we do thank you that we are able to come to you, to your throne of grace this morning as your chosen people, bought by the blood of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Lord Jesus. We thank you, dear Father, for the word that became flesh and dwelt among us, dear Father. We beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Lord, we do thank you, Lord, for that great, abundant, unmatchless grace that you have shown to us, Lord. And truly, dear Father, there's no greater gift that you have shown to us. Redemption, forgiveness of sins, and peace with our God, who at once we are at war with because of our great transgressions against you. Lord, we do thank you and praise you for your great mercies to sinners. In this time of, of rejoicing, as we remember your greatest gift, your Father, sending your own, only begotten Son into this world. Lord, I thank you for the faith that you bestowed upon us, upon your people. Lord, we pray that you would continue to bless and encourage and nurture our faith, Lord. Help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Savior to know you, to love you, and to love one another, dear Lord. Thank you for the great example that your son has given to us, and we pray that we would be worthy of the calling. Lord, we do pray for the needs of our church. We do thank you, dear Father, that among us there are so many, Lord, who lift up one another daily in prayer. Lord, we lift up our, our, our sister this morning, the Father Fur Furkani and her daughter, Adiana. We thank you that she was able to get through the chemo treatments, and we do pray that you would help her through the stem cell therapy. We thank you for the love of her sister, Mary, in sharing that uh, with her, dear Father, in donating the stem cells for that. We pray that this might be something that would bring faith and your grace to their family, Lord, that they would know you and trust in you, your Father. We thank you for our missionaries. We do pray for the situation in Israel and in Gaza, that as you alone can bring peace in the land, that you would bring it into the hearts of the people, that their, or, their wars might end not only amongst one another, but against you, that they might come to faith and believe and trust in you, dear Father, that you as the only one who could bring peace, not only in the world, but in the hearts of men. Lord, bless our time together. Bless Ryan as he will be preaching today. We pray that you would bless your word and that it would not return void and it would accomplish its purpose to bring you praise and honor and glory and salvation to the ears to those who hear it. To you be all praise and honor and glory through your son. In his name we pray, amen. Would you all stand with us as we sing the next song? Um, we'll sing together of the unshaking faithfulness of our Lord Jesus Christ towards us as we sing this hymn, Be Still My Soul.
Well, good morning once again, and uh, I want to especially welcome those of you who are visiting once again. We're, we're so glad that you've, you've joined us here on this uh, third Sunday of Advent. And if you want to turn in your Bibles, um, you can turn to Isaiah chapter 61. We're going to be looking at uh, the whole chapter today. That's page, uh, begins on page 620 in the Pew Bibles, if you want to follow along there. So this is the, the third Sunday of Advent, and it's traditionally known as Gaudete Sunday. Now, I'm sure most of us aren't, um, you know, our, our Latin's a little rusty. Gaudete is a, a Latin word that means rejoice. Each of the four Sundays of Advent has a particular theme, and the, the theme for this Sunday, this third week of Advent, is joy, is joy. Um, Advent is as we've been saying, a, a time of longing, even you could say aching, anticipating and waiting for the, the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, um, longing and waiting for him to come and set everything right and to uh, come and break into our lives, break into this world. But in, in week three of Advent, we sort of turn the corner from, from longing to joy. Uh, it's not quite Christmas yet, but, but we're almost there and, and we're remembering that our Lord has come uh, a first time. And, and so our, our waiting and our longing begin to mingle with celebration and, and joy. Now, I realize I, I'm talking about joy here and some of you are starting to put up walls. Uh, between your heart and my words. Um, for some of you, maybe the whole idea of joy just sounds a little too um, sentimental. You know, joy is for people whose lives resemble a, a Hallmark Christmas movie. You know, it, it's not for people um, with real lives in the real world. It's not for people who live in a world where cancer exists. It's not for people who live in a world filled with um, disappointment and regrets and, and pain. Um, some of you have, have been wounded by the joy police. Do, do, do you know the people I mean? You know, um, people who confuse just uh, glib positivity with Christian joy. Um, they, they equate just kind of emotional avoidance with Christian joy. And, and they don't really have a whole lot of patience for people who um, lack their always sunny disposition. You know, if you violate, you know, their, their rules, their good vibes only rule, um, watch out because they're going to let you have it. You know, they're going to give you an earful about how you're, you're a poor excuse for a Christian with all your, your sorrow and your grief. Um, it, it's challenging to talk about joy. At, during Advent and, and Christmas. I mean, the, the season itself just seems to magnify all the reasons not to be joyful, right? And, and yet we're bombarded with messages about how happy we should be. You know, at Christmas morning, you might wake up and there's a, a brand new vehicle waiting for you and your whole life is going to change and, you know, everything will be wonderful. You know, some of you are probably already experiencing, we're, we're midway through December, we're not even at Christmas yet, and you're probably experiencing happiness fatigue, just this bombardment of, of voices trying to force you to be positive. And so I realized, you know, some of you might be suspicious of all this uh, joy talk. I, I want you to realize this morning that um, Christian joy... It's not a plastic smile. It's not just some kind of forced happiness that just kind of ignores the, the realities of life in a broken world. It's, it's not glib positivity. Christian joy is, is something more than that. It's something deeper. Um, one theologian has described Christian joy as an act of resistance against despair and its forces. I, I think that's the best description of Christian joy I've come across in a long time. An, a, an act of resistance against despair and its forces. You see, um, Christian joy doesn't deny the, the painful realities of life. Christian joy protests those things. 
Um, Christian joy refuses to give in to pain's invitation to despair. Um, the, the poet Christian Wyman, he says, Joy is the only inoculation against the despair to which any sane person is prone. Uh, this is Advent joy. This is, this is defiant joy. This is the kind of joy the gospel of Jesus Christ invites us into. And our passage today is, it's all about this joy. Um, the possibility of a joy that resists despair. We've been reading the book of Isaiah together over the past few uh, weeks, and, and we've heard his message of hope and comfort to the people of Israel. Last week we looked at um, chapter 40. And uh, Israel's facing exile because of their sins. It's, it's, a, it's a mess that they're headed into. It's a mess of their own making. And, and yet God comes to them through his prophet Isaiah, and he announces a message of comfort. Um, God has not given up on his sinful, wayward, rebellious people. He, he, God announces to them that he still loves them. Despite their idolatry, despite their sins, he still loves them, and he will restore them. He will bring them home. Exile will not be the end of their story. And it's a message of comfort. And, and today in chapter 61, as we kind of fast forward a bit in, in the book, Isaiah delivers a message of joy. Uh, God will send his Messiah to his people. And when Messiah comes, he's going to set everything right, and he's going to give God's people everlasting joy. And listen, this message about everlasting joy, Messiah coming, it's not just something that was for ancient Israel. This is a message for us too. Um, God has sent his Messiah into the world to end our exile and bring us home to God. And, and God will send his Messiah again to make everything right. And when he comes, he will remake the world and everlasting joy will be our reality forever and ever. So let me read our, our passage for us today, Isaiah chapter 61. Um, we're going to look at the whole chapter, uh, verses 1 to 11. Um, again, that's page 620 if you want to follow along in the Pew Bible. This is God's Word. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives in the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and tend your flocks. Foreigners shall be your plowmen and vine dressers. But you shall be called the priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring shall be known among the nations, and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them that they are an offspring the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation he has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. 
For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. This is God's word. Let me take a moment and pray for us one more time. Our God and Father, we ask that your love, the grace of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of your Holy Spirit would be with us as we look at your word this morning. Would you bring us a word of comfort, a word of hope, a word of joy? We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, why is joy possible? Why can you and I have a a joy that resists despair? This passage shows us three reasons. Three reasons why joy is possible. Number one, because of God's Messiah. Number two, because of God's promised future. And number three, because of God's faithfulness. So God's Messiah, God's promised future, and God's faithfulness. So first, let's, let's think about um, joy is possible because of God's Messiah, uh, verses 1 to 3. And here in this chapter, we, we hear two different voices um, speak to us. And the, and the first is God's Messiah. We hear him uh, there beginning in verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. That, that anointing language, it gives us the word Messiah. Um, Messiah simply means anointed one. And, and here, God's Messiah... His, his God's king, God's royal deliverer, announces his mission here to us in these verses. Now, if you're familiar with the Bible, maybe you've read Luke 4, and you remember how Jesus begins his ministry in, in Luke 4 at, at the synagogue in Nazareth, his, his, what was likely one of his first sermons. And, and Jesus reads from the Isaiah scroll, and, and he, and he gets to this particular passage, and he reads these verses. And then when he's done reading, he he rolls up the scroll, and he sits down. And Luke tells us the whole uh, congregation there in the synagogue is just kind of amazed at what they've just heard. And he says to them, "Um, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus is saying, look, I'm the one. I'm the anointed one, Isaiah uh, promised. And, And this is my mission. And so first I want you to to notice here as we think about joy is possible because of the Messiah, I want you to notice the kind of people Messiah is drawn to. The kind of people he is drawn to. You know, when Messiah comes into the world, what kind of people does he rub shoulders with? And he he tells us uh, four categories of people here. I'll I'll just list them for you. The the poor, or it could be um, translated the afflicted, the brokenhearted, um, captives and those who are bound, and then fourth, those who mourn. Um, these are people who have hit rock bottom. This is not a who's who list of um, the rich and the powerful and the, and the famous. These are people in trouble, people in distress, people in despair. And, and we might wonder, are these um, social and, and economic categories or are they, they spiritual categories, you know, is, is Jesus saying he, he came for the financially needy or for the, the spiritually impoverished? And, and really, there's no need to choose here. The, the language is very general. It, it, it's broad enough to include um, those whose wallets are empty and those who are suffering from spiritual poverty, um, people who are behind bars and, and people who are enslaved to their own addictions. Um, these are the people Jesus the Messiah is drawn to. He's drawn to broken, hurting, sinful, messed up people. And and the second thing I want you to notice is what the Messiah does for these sinful, hurting, broken, messed up people. And he lists uh, six tasks here. I'll I'll try to move through them uh, quickly. Number one, in in verse one, he came to bring good news to the poor. Um, That that language there, good news, that's gospel language. Uh, the, The Messiah comes with an announcement that God's kingdom has broken into this dark world and the king has come and he has defeated sin and death and from now on, everything will be different. He comes to bring good news. Uh, Number two, he comes to bind up the brokenhearted. Just um, 
I, I wish we could spend a whole sermon on this one. It's such a beautiful picture, that, that phrase, bind up. Um, it, it's the idea of healing a wound, caring for, for oozing wounds. Um, it doesn't say, I came to fix. <laughs> I came to heal. Um, in the Lord of the Rings, um, yes, I'm a Lord of the Rings geek. In, in the Lord of the Rings books, um, the, the people are waiting for the true king to return. They're, they're waiting for him to show up and, and to defeat the forces of evil. And, and there's a legend about the king that runs throughout the whole story. And, and it goes like this, the, the hands of a king are the hands of a healer. And, and Jesus comes as the king who heals and and his healing hands can reach down into the darkness and the brokenness and the hurt and the pain deep within us and bring true healing i have come to bind up the brokenhearted he says number three i've come to proclaim liberty to the captives the opening of the prison to those who are bound um i once spent a day in prison in in mexico and I was not there as a prisoner. I was there as a Bible teacher. But um, I spent about eight, eight hours, ten hours there at that prison. Um, when I stepped out of the prison, it felt so good. <laughs> it felt so good. Jesus says, I, I've come to set prisoners free. Uh, number four, I've come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the, the year of, of the Lord's grace. Now, if you've ever read Leviticus, maybe that phrase, the year of the Lord's favor, sounds um, familiar to you. It comes from Leviticus chapter 25, um, about the year of Jubilee. And uh, it was this time that um, Israel was supposed to um, celebrate every 50 years. And it was, um, it was like a, a, a year-long party, <laughs> kind of a, a, a big reset. All debts were forgiven. All lands that had been forfeited because of um, foreclosure were returned to the original owners. All the slaves were, were given their freedom. And, and Jesus is saying, when I come, when Messiah comes, I'm coming to kick off um, a, a big party that the year of Jubilee was just a, a small picture of. And, and, but notice the next phrase there. And the day of vengeance of our God. You know, the, the year of the Lord's favor, the year of grace, that sounds great. That sounds like happy news. Um, the, the day of God's vengeance, that doesn't sound so happy. Um, doesn't sound so Christmassy, right? Um, but, it, but it's certainly good news if you're one of the oppressed, if you're one of the, the afflicted, if you're one of the poor and powerless who are being crushed under the weight of the powerful. God will call oppressors to account and he will break their power forever. That, that's what Jesus is saying. Number five, he comes to comfort all who mourn. And, and the sixth task uh, picks up on that in verse three. Um, look at verse three there. Notice uh, this final task. There's a instead of formula. I come to give them, those who mourn in Zion, I come to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes. The oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise, instead of a faint spirit. Um, sackcloth and ashes, ashes smeared on the forehead were, were signs of mourning, signs of, of grief. And, and when Messiah comes, the days of mourning are over. And, and he gives his people, um, you could say, a, a, a very dramatic makeover. They exchange their, the, the mourning clothes, the, the funeral attire, for, for party clothes. That's what um, a beautiful headdress or a crown and, and garments of praise. They are, they are expensive, beautiful clothes that you would wear to a big celebration. And so the Messiah comes. It's, there's no more sorrow. It's, it's party time. He kicks off the, the biggest party the world has ever seen. And, and what's the result of, of Messiah's work? He comes for broken, beat-up people, and he comes to do these things. And the result, we, we see in verse 3, that these broken, uh, poor, oppressed people might be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. And, and that, that imagery there, oaks of righteousness, it's, it's this idea of stability, strength, 
um, security. It, Messiah comes to transform the broken, the poor, the oppressed, the afflicted into people that, that exude strength and beauty. That God may be glorified, he says, the, the, the ultimate goal. So the, the first reason joy is possible. Why is joy possible for us as, as Christians here today? It's because of God's Messiah. But, but how so? I mean, how, how does Messiah's ministry make joy possible? And I, I want you to understand it. Messiah's ministry, his coming to us means that God has not given up on us. God has not given up on us. You see, you and I, um, all of us, all human beings, uh, going all the way back to our first parents, Adam and Eve, we have turned away from God. Every single one of us. In, in our sin, we are, we are poor, we are broken, we are enslaved. But God didn't wait for us to turn back to him. He, he didn't wait for us to kind of get our act together, pick ourselves up by our bootstraps, clean ourselves up, become righteous, successful, emotionally well-adjusted people, he came to us. He came down into the darkness and the chaos and the brokenness to us. I mean, isn't that what Christmas is all about? I mean, when, at Christmas, when we're singing and celebrating, we're talking about God coming to us in human flesh. God the Son becoming a man, becoming the, the King who heals, becoming the Savior who rescues from sin and death. You see, every other religious system says that we have to get ourselves back to God. You know, we have to clean ourselves up. We have to fix the brokenness. It's up to us. And we have to bridge that divide that, that exists between us and God. And, and Christianity says that's not how it works. That's not how it works. God comes to us in the Messiah, in, in Jesus. Uh, Jesus is God's answer to our brokenness. He, you know, Jesus was rich in glory, and yet he became poor for our sake so that we could become rich in him. Um, he gave his body to be broken at the cross so that we could be made whole. He was stripped naked so that we could be clothed in his righteousness. God has not given up on us. Joy is possible. It's also possible because Messiah gets us. I mean, you hear him talk here about who he cares about, who he's drawn to. Um, it, it's people like us, people who, who are um, beaten down, people who are maybe getting ready to throw in the towel. We've got nothing left. We're, we're broken by life. We're broken by our sin. We're broken by others' sins. And, and Scripture tells us that this Jesus was a, a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief. We, we sang a few moments ago that he came to taste our sadness. Um, he, Jesus doesn't come to brokenhearted men and women and, and say, you know, he doesn't come with pep talks. I mean, that's what we often do with people who are, who are down, right? Um, chin up, uh, stop your moping around. Um, you know, look on the bright side. Uh, we love that bright side theology. Um, Jesus is a, is a friend who comes and sits with us in our sorrows. He, he knows grief. He knows sorrow. I mean, you, you see him there in Gethsemane, agonizing, sinking down into the pit. He's not indifferent to your pain. And maybe you wonder that sometimes. Does he have time for me? I, I'm so needy. Um, he doesn't get tired of your neediness. It, it, it's, it draws him to you. He doesn't get tired of um, your need for healing, your need for wholeness, your need for comfort, your need for, for his presence. It, it, it doesn't repel him. He's drawn to it. And so joy is, is possible because Messiah sees us. Jesus knows us and he's drawn to us. Um, Second reason joy is possible is because of God's promised future. Uh, verses 4 to 7, God's promised future. In this next section, um, God makes some, some stunning promises to his people about their future. Um, in, in particular, he promises three things. Look at verse 4. 
the first thing he promises is a new beginning. A new beginning. Verse 4, they, that is those who were mourning in Zion, shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Now, if you know your Old Testament history, you know that Babylon swept into Israel and they, they, they destroyed Jerusalem, um, brought, brought the, that city to its knees and, and all the surrounding villages, um, piles of rubble and, and ash. And, and God promises that when he brings his people out of exile and brings them back home, they will rebuild what was lost. Um, and, and realize this is more than just a construction project. Um, this is about restoration and renewal. This is about a, a new beginning, um, something beautiful emerging out of the, the ashes and the rubble. Um, some of you probably remember the, the Witch Creek Fire in 2007, and it, um, it tore through the Westwood neighborhood just south of us in Rancho Bernardo. It's actually the neighborhood that Stephanie grew up in, and uh, one of our longtime friends lost her, her family home, as did um, dozens of other families in, in the neighborhood. It was just a, a devastating fire. And um, until last June, so almost 16 years later, um, some of the roads in the community hadn't been repaired yet. Uh, many of the homes had been rebuilt, but some of the roads themselves had not been fully repaired. And then finally, last summer, the city of San Diego um, fixed the, the damage caused by uh, the fire. And it is really interesting um, reading what some of the residents had to say about this. I mean, we might think, big deal, it's, it's asphalt, what's the, what's the big deal? But some of the residents there described this as, as a new beginning, um, a, a path to healing. You see, it, it represented so much more than just um, smooth asphalt. It, it, it was a sign of, of new life of restoration. It, it was a, a new beginning. So God promises his people a new beginning, but uh, number two, a, a new name, a new name. Uh, you can see it there in verse six. You shall be called the priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. Um, who knows what, what terrible names uh, their oppressors called them uh, during the exile. Um, whatever the case, God promises they'll be known now by the honorable name of God's ministers, his priests to the nations. And so what, what is being promised here is, is really a reversal, a reversal. Um, there, Israel, God's people, are no longer going to be um, oppressed. The, the boot is going to be taken off of their necks, and, and they will now be honored as God's servants. But, but notice... Reversal does not mean that Israel now becomes the oppressor. So it's not just a, a strict reversal. The, the oppressors become the oppressed, and the oppressed become the oppressors. And, and at first glance, you know, verse 5 might seem to say that. Verse 5 describes strangers, foreigners, um, uh, working Israel's land, farming it, tending the flocks. And at the end of verse 6, uh, we, we read about uh, Israel enjoying the the wealth of the nations. And it, it sounds like, you know, Israel's uh, ruling with an iron fist now. But, but if we had been reading all through Isaiah, we would remember earlier God promised that when the nations see what he does for his people, when, when the nations hear about how he's uh, rescued his people from exile, they're going to take note and they're, they're going to realize that Israel's God is the one true God and they're going to flock to Israel. They're going to flock to Israel and join themselves to Israel's God and become full members of the covenant community. And so the, the foreigners here are not slaves. They're, they're, they're uh, fellow members of God's people. So a, a new beginning, a new name. And then third, God promises new joy, new joy. Uh, look at verse 7. Notice the, the instead of language again. Instead of shame, a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they will rejoice. And so God promises when he removes the disgrace of, of defeat and captivity, the people will rejoice. And that, that language of uh, a double portion, you know, that in those days the eldest child received a double portion of the father's estate. And so the, the idea here is just abundance of blessing and honor will be theirs. 
and, and the result of all this newness, new beginning, new name, the result is new joy. At the end of verse 7, they shall have everlasting joy. And earlier in the book, in Isaiah 35, Isaiah, um, he says that when the Lord brings Israel back, um, their heads will be crowned with joy. <laughs> and and uh, they'll obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing will flee away. And we need to realize um, this future that God promises here, it's about more than coming home from, from Babylon. This is about a world made new. This is about the, the new heavens and the new earth that Isaiah will describe later in, in the book in chapter 65. The, the same new heavens and new earth that John describes in Revelation 21. You see, this future that, that Messiah talks about here, this is the future that God promises to us in Jesus Christ. This is a world restored, a world characterized by, by newness and life and, and sin and death are no more. This is a world where sorrow and sighing have fled forever, never to be heard from again. This is a world where shattered dreams are a thing of the past, and there's, there's no more sickness, no more disease, no more loss. It, it's a world where nations bless and serve each other rather than kill and maim each other. It's a world where shame and dishonor are no more, and there is only joy and always joy forever and ever. Amen. This is the, the future that Jesus launched at his first coming. His future is already broken into our lives through Jesus Christ, and, and this is the future he will bring when he comes again. Uh, I don't know if you realize it, but when we sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel, we're not just simply um, pretending to be the Israelites before Christ first coming. Um, this is what we're longing for. This, this world made new and restored, a, a world full of everlasting joy. We are saying, Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus, come and make all things new. Now, I, I know what some of you are thinking as you hear this, because I, I go there myself. Um, you know, that sounds great and all, but that's then and this is now. And this world ain't anything like that world. You know, how does God's promised future make joy possible today? Um, there's, a, there's a line from um, a Wendell Berry poem that I think um, speaks to this. And it, and it says, um, Whatever is foreseen in joy must be lived out from day to day. Whatever is foreseen in joy must be lived out from day to day. And, and what he's saying is, is this, that, that future that, that we get glimpses of in the pages of Scripture, um, for example, here in Isaiah 61, that future that we get a glimpse of, we have to let it shape us today, now. Um, we have to, to get the, the hope and the, the anticipation of it. We, we have to let it electrify our imaginations and get down into our, our heart and soul and so that it can flavor how we, how we think and, and, and what we desire and, and how we pray and, and how we engage the, the pain and the hurt and the disappointments of the here and now. Whatever is foreseen in joy must be lived out from day to day. Um, it, it's sort of like when you were a child and, and you knew Christmas was coming. Um, you know, maybe it's a week away, two weeks away, and, and you're excited, right? You're anticipating um, opening presents and, and you're curious what they might be. And, and that excitement of the fact that Christmas is coming, that excitement it kind of colors how you see everything, right? Your, your chores don't seem so um, oppressive any longer. And um, your, your siblings don't, they're not as annoying as they, as they were just a, a month before. And um, it, it's because something good is coming and it, and it kind of shapes how you, how you live in the, the lead up to Christmas, and then, of course, Christmas comes and you don't get what you want and you turn into a little monster. But, um, 
but, but foreseen joy, it, it, it shapes the present. And that's, that's something like the effect of this, this future that God promises to us in Jesus Christ. It, it's not here yet. The world's not like this. And yet the reality of it has broken into our lives in, in Jesus Christ and his saving grace. And, and it shapes how we do today. And I think the phrase, and yet, captures, you know, something of this dynamic. As, as Christians, we, we can and should acknowledge um, that, that this life is hard. Um, it, you know, bodies don't work the way they're supposed to. And, and relationships uh, fall apart. Um, God doesn't always take away the disease. And God doesn't expect us to pretend that those things are no big deal. Um, I, I don't need to remind you, but I will remind you. The Psalms give us a whole vocabulary for expressing grief and sorrow and lament about the hard things that happen in this life. But, but because of God's promise, this future that he's promised to us in Jesus Christ, a, a world made new, um, we, we, we can add the phrase, and yet... And I don't mean that every time you express that something's hard, you have to caveat it with and yet. That would just be ridiculous. Um, what I mean is that the, the reality that and yet um, points to makes authentic joy possible. Yes, um, I, I don't like this thing that's happening to me right now. It's, it's terrible. It's awful. Um, I wish it would just go away. I wish I could just run and hide from it. And yet, Jesus rose from the dead. He's going to make all things new. He's going to set things right one day. It's that and yet that makes joy possible, that, that makes it possible to resist the forces of, of despair. Doesn't mean everything is, um, you know, butterflies and unicorns. <laughs> um, it, it means that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. It's what the Apostle Paul calls being sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. So why is joy possible? It's possible first because of God's Messiah. Second, because of God's promised future. And then third, the, the final reason for joy, because of God's faithfulness. Because of his faithfulness. And we see this in, in verses 8 to 11. Um, we've heard the Messiah speak in, in the first seven verses, and now we hear the second voice. It's the Lord himself um, who speaks in verses 8 and 9. And, and he, he comes with a word of assurance. You know, he wants us to know that that, that promised future, it's certain. It's solid. And, and it's certain because of who he is. Look at verse 8. He says, For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. And, and what he's saying here is, yes, Israel's sins got them into the mess of exile, but that doesn't excuse their oppressors. And God is devoted to justice, and because he's devoted to justice, he's going to right every wrong done to his people. There, that future's coming because God is devoted to making things right. And then he goes on in verse 80, he promises to make a, a new covenant with them. He says, I will faithfully give them their recompense or their reward. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And you notice the way this covenant is described, an everlasting covenant. Israel had, had broken the, the Mosaic covenant, and, and God promises to make a new, unbreakable covenant. A covenant's a, a relationship. God is binding himself to his people, and this covenant and all the blessings associated with it depends on God's faithfulness. That, that's why it's an everlasting covenant. It doesn't depend on his people's faithfulness. It depends on him. And he, and he goes on in verse 9 to promise uh, that he'll multiply them and, and bless them, just as he told Abraham he would do. And because God is faithful, he raises up a faithful covenant partner to save his people. Verses 10 and 11. Verses 10 and 11. The, the God speaks in verses 8 and 9, and then Messiah, Messiah resumes his speech in these final two verses. And, and what's his response to God's covenant faithfulness? As he hears God's declaration that 
I will faithfully establish my covenant with my people forever and ever. Messiah erupts in joy. In joy. Look at what he says. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God. It's emphatic here. I will, I will joy joy in the Lord is, is kind of a, a wooden translation. Um, why such exuberance? Well, he says, for he, the Lord, has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. And this, this language about garments and clothing, it, it's saying that the Lord has perfectly outfitted the Messiah for his task to bring salvation to his people. He, he's perfectly suited to accomplish um, the rescue we need. And, and notice... Um, Messiah's joy here, it, it has the feeling of a wedding celebration. He uses this imagery of a, a groom with this uh, beautiful, um, uh, beautiful garments and this crown, you know, something he would wear on his wedding day. Or, or the flip side, the, the bride who would uh, adorn herself with just stunning, radiant jewelry. Um, Jesus is saying that he enjoys saving us. Um, when he comes to save and work this rescue, for him it's this giant celebration um, because it brings him delight to do it. It's what he wants to do. And, and you know the, the marvelous thing in the gospel is that Jesus shares this robe of righteousness with us. Um, we trade our rags, our filthy rags, for his spotless robe of righteousness, his his righteousness is credited to us. And so, how certain is this future that God has promised? Well, it's as certain and reliable as nature itself, we, we see, um, as the, the imagery shifts in verse 11 from um, a wedding to a garden. We read, for as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. You know, if, if nature is reliable, if you can put a, a tiny seed down into the soil and expect that at some point it's going to sprout up and, and, and bear fruit, how much more so is, is nature's creator reliable? See, the, the, this future, new life, new world, um, everlasting joy, these, these things are as certain as God is faithful. Um, Kate Bowler says, this is why joy exists despite all the reasons why it shouldn't. You know, joy, it sprouts up in our lives as Christians. D despite the fact that it seems like there's not much reason for it to do so. And the, the reason is because God is faithful. His faithful love has broken into our lives in, in Jesus Christ. Um, he's fulfilling his ancient promises. You see, God planted his son in the earth, a seed of the new creation. And on Easter morning, God caused that, that seed to burst forth with life. And uh, the, the risen Jesus Christ is God's guarantee that he's going to make all things new. This wasn't just a, a one and done thing with Jesus. He's going to, he's going to make all things new. And he's already began, he's already begun that work in, in those of us who trust in Jesus Christ, who know Jesus Christ. We are new creations in Christ, but one day all things will be made new. Jesus is God's pledge to us of everlasting joy. And so the, the call to us as we wait, as we long for that day, the, the call to us is to rejoice defiantly. To rejoice defiantly because Christ has come. To rejoice defiantly and resist the siren call of, of despair because Christ will come again. Everlasting joy will be ours in Christ. Let me pray for us.
Our God and Father, I ask that you would fortify us against the forces of of despair. Would you give us a, a deep, defiant, abiding joy in and through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? It's in his name we ask. Amen. Part of what's so amazing about the situation we find ourselves in, it's a little different from Isaiah 61, is that we're looking back on that everlasting covenant that has been made. Uh, It's looking ahead. Can you imagine an arrangement with God where he did it all for us? And they're imagining it. And we're saying that arrangement has been made. And we're defiantly choosing to believe that it's true. That's what the Lord's Supper reminds us of. The body and blood of our Savior that was given for us. Jesus says when we drink of the cup, this cup is the new covenant. Which we understand to be the everlasting covenant. Where God does it all and we receive it by faith. And in spite of and despite what we have done. That's amazingly good news, isn't it? And it's news that can be hard for us to believe. And so the Lord gives us this this visible word that we can taste and touch and see to say these things are true and they will surely be. The Lord's Supper is a time for those who are believers. This is amazing news that's held out, but it's news of an invitation that there's only one way that you receive the benefits of this everlasting covenant. And it's by faith. It's by looking outside yourself to the work of another, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, who came and accomplished everything that was needed. So all that we heard about today could be true of us and could be declared to be right and just by our God. And so if you haven't trusted in Christ before, if you're not sure, if you're looking to him rather than yourself, your own good works, whatever it might be, then as we partake of this, we we ask that you don't eat the bread and drink the cup, but hear these words of invitation and see people like yourself who are clinging to Jesus and his work alone and know that you are invited to join us by faith. And we would love to talk with you about that afterward. And then you can follow Christ in baptism and then eat and drink together with us one day. Uh, But it's a time for believers. And as believers, um, as we prepare our hearts to participate in this. The scriptures call us to look at the work of our King, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the song that we're gonna sing, the King and all his beauty, reminds us of how it is that the wonders of our salvation came to us. And it's by what we celebrate at Christmas time, the Lord Jesus stooping to come, to suffer, to die, and then to be raised up so that we could be raised in splendor with him one day. So let's sing together the king and all his beauty. Uh, You maybe remain seated and then um, we'll have the Lord's Supper together. Thank you. 
The Lord's Supper reassures us that that promise is true, that for endless ages we'll adore the King in all his beauty. And what's amazing is we'll be clothed in that beauty as well. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this gift, sheer gift of your grace a gift that we week in and we ache out just call salvation, but speaks of so much. Saving us from our sin, conquering all of our enemies, promising that you will heal and bind up every wound, that you will make all things right, that all the injustices that we bear will one day be made just that all the tears that we shed will one day stop, that sighing and sorrow will never come near again. And this is all because of what you've done for us through Jesus Christ. Our Savior, we thank you that you were eager to come and to suffer and die for the joy set before you that would be a wedding with us. So we give you thanks for all this. Help us to believe it and to defiantly claim it as true, even in the sorrows and difficulties of this life. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. The Apostle Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. And then in the same way also, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together.
For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And when he comes again, we will know the fullness of life that he already enjoys. And so even so we say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, on this third Sunday of Advent, we look forward with longing for the joy that will be ours. And we look forward in anticipation uh, to that joy that will be. And so um, it's fitting that we close our service with this song of response, really, singing again together, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And you notice in the one, two, three, four, fourth stanza there, O come thou day spring from on high, and cheer us by thy drawing nigh, disperse the gloomy clouds of night, and death's dark shadows put to flight. The Lord Jesus is drawing near us even now by his spirit to bring us that joy. And so we ask for that this morning and then we look forward to the day when it will be in its fullness. So I invite you to stand if you're able and let's sing together, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
Well, as our God keeps us on that path until one day the things of misery are no more, hear God's words of blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. You may go in that hope this morning. Amen.